Hi, welcome back to The Backpacker Coach. And today, I wanna answer just one question. Is the bunny boot the warmest boot in the world? And so we're going to try to figure out whether the bunny boot, or also known as the extreme vapor barrier boot, is the warmest boot in the world. We're gonna run some tests, some tests that you've hopefully never seen before on YouTube, and we are going to kind of compare it to a couple different winter boots. We're going to show you who still uses this boot and also want to go over my experience with this boot because I have a lot of experience of years with this boot. So let's get into it. But how did we get here? Let's look at a very small timeline of how we got to the bunny boot. First was the Mukluk boot. And we actually stole this from the indigenous people of Alaska. You can see this photo. We stole this. Now, it was a decent boot, but it had obviously a couple huge drawbacks. One, obviously it's just made of some sort of canvas and leather. So there's no hard bottom, there's no grip on the bottom, and there's no ankle support. It's a muckluck. That's how they're designed. And being that this boot was only made of canvas, it really only worked in extremely cold weather. If it got to anything that was a little bit slushy or a little warmer, then obviously the water would seep into this muckluck boot and your feet would be frozen. So that was one of the biggest drawbacks to this muckluck boot. So he came, they came up with next is the felt boot. The felt boot, although it did work when it was dry, it had one major drawback and when it got wet, the felt didn't work anymore. So that didn't go over very well. And from what I understand, the 10th Mountain Division mostly just used it as maybe an after ski boot, but they didn't really use it as much else because it really wasn't good for much else. So next we have the pack boot. Now you can see that the pack boot has a, has a rubber of the bottom part of the boot is rubber. It comes up and then the top part is leather. It looks very similar to the Sorel boot, as you can see. But the, the way that this had, in, the only insulation it had was a thick felt bottom. That's all it was on the bottom. And this, this boot was used primarily at the end of World War II and into the Korean War. And you can see these pictures are from World War II and the Korean War. So obviously they had some major issues with all the military people getting some major frostbite on their feet. And so they had to come up with something better. And so that's when they came up with the Mickey Mouse boot. And you can see why this was called the Mickey Mouse boot, because it looked like Mickey Mouse's feet. Okay, so that was good down to um, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which wasn't bad, but it, obviously it still had some major issues. It still was not warm enough. So then they came out with a new iteration of that same boot, and that is the bunny boot. And that is now good down to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're probably wondering, why did they call it the bunny boot? Well, they named it after this little fuzzy guy because of his big gigantic fuzzy feet. The snowshoe hare has big gigantic white feet. So there you go. That's why it's called the bunny boot. But you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, backpacker coach, you're missing something. Well, kind of, but kind of not. If you think that I'm missing the green muckluck with the rubber bottom, and it looks like it's technology from like 1950, 1960, 
you would be correct that it does look like that kind of technology. But actually, this boot here actually came out and was used in the 1990s. Can you believe that? It actually had a rubber bottom and it had a canvas um, upper and then it had two huge thick wool insulated bottom insoles and then it also had a wool booty which you can see here and they used that they issued those to the Air Force here's the weird thing though it's like all right it was it's maybe not going to get all that wet and so they just did the canvas thing but here's the odd thing in 1987 the 10th Mountain Division started using Gore-Tex on all of their jackets and pants. By the end of 1987, the entire military switched over to all to Gore-Tex. In 1987, so why didn't they make these boots at least Gore-Tex? I mean, it would be pretty easy to make a nice rubber bottom sole and then Gore-Tex and then have all the same insulation on the inside but then you would just have a little bit better, you know, boot. Quite as a problem t dealing with water. At least you would, no matter what would happen, no matter what condition you'd be in, it'd be very unlikely that your feet would ever get wet. But for whatever reason, they decided to go with canvas. So, shame on you, military. That was silly. So let's take a look at the construction of this boot. And no, I'm not going to um, hacksaw it in half. Um, somebody already has done that. So let's get into how this boot is made. Okay, I wanted to talk to you about how the bunny boot combats the three different kinds of heat loss. So there's conduction, convection, and radiation. The first one I want to talk about is conduction, and that is about whatever your foot is touching, such as cold snow, you lose heat by whatever you're touching. And so you can see that the bunny boot has is just over an inch of this wool that protects you from touching the snow. Plus, of course, you also have the little bit of rubber as well. That protects you from the conduction part of touching the snow. Next, we're gonna talk about convection. Convection essentially is cold air displacing the warm air. So a good example of this is when the wind blows, you can feel the cold on your skin. Essentially, what is happening is the cold air is displacing the warm air around your body. Therefore, you feel colder. And with convection, you have to figure out a way to slow that process down. Next is radiation. While we all know that the body radiates heat. But did you know that the body loses 65% of its heat through radiation? With radiation, you have to figure out some way to trap that heat next to your body. So the best way to keep the heat in and to keep the cold out is by having three layers of quarter inch wool on the back and four layers of quarter inch wool on the front. And if I would have to guess, this other kind of white wool probably is not as dense as the dark wool, being that the light wool needs to be able to actually hold in heat and have like little pockets of heat, kind of similar like how down works, as opposed to the dark wool. It doesn't need to trap the heat. It only needs to block the cold from the bottom. There's one more thing this boot has up its sleeve to combat extreme cold weather. It's actually in the name, Extreme, Extreme Cold, cold vapor, vapor Barrier boot. boot. So to explain this, let's look at the Sorel boot. When you put your foot inside the Sorel boot and you wear it for a while, what happens? Your feet sweat and it's so-called breathes. And where does all the vapor go? It all goes into the booty. Well, here's the interesting thing. We all know that wool does better than cotton when it gets wet. But, even so, wool still does lose the ability to keep you warm even when it does get wet. But what I didn't know is that wool 
will lose somewhere between 30 to 60% of its ability to keep you warm when it gets wet. So now let's look at the bunny boot. So instead of a wool booty getting wet and eventually making your foot cold because it's not at working at 100%, well, the bunny boot does it a little differently. So instead of having just a wool booty, you have a inner rubber layer, then the insulation, and then an outer rubber layer. So this protects all the insulation. It never gets wet, either from your sweat or from the outside. The insulation never gets wet, so it's always working at 100%. Also, you have a wood shank that runs along here, and that helps to give the boot support so it's not flimsy and so you're able to feel better walking for longer distances and to be able to you know climb up ladders and that kind of stuff so it you don't feel stuff that if you're um, putting stuff right on your arch of your foot just quickly i wanted to compare the construction between the bunny boot and the sorrel boot if you notice the difference between the sorrel boot and the bunny boot you can clearly see that there's a huge difference in the amount of insulation. As we went over before, the bunny boot has pretty much over an inch of insulation compared to the Sorel boot, really only has a quarter inch of insulation everywhere. Very big difference. As well as the other difference that we went over with the how the bunny boot works. So you might be wondering, what is this valve thing on the side? And everybody always gets confused. They think, oh, it's maybe to pump air into the boot or something. No, it's not to pump air into the boot. So what this is actually for is when the way this boot is constructed is that it has a rubber layer and then it has insulation and then it has another rubber layer. And the, all those rubber layers are all vulcanized together, which is a specific kind of um, the way it attaches. And so it's completely watertight and no water can get in and no air can get in. So it is completely sealed. But there's a problem. If it would be completely sealed with no valve, let me show you what will happen. So have you ever seen what happens when you seal a bag at lower altitude and then you go up to higher altitude and there, the air can't escape. This. See how it's extremely puffy? And it, if you got high enough, this could explode. Like that. Big explosion. So, to, to be able to um, combat that, they put a valve on the outside so the air that's inside it can go in and out when they go up to high altitudes, like when they're jumping out of an airplane. And then when they get back to the ground, then they retighten it and they're good to go. And no water or anything gets inside there because it's, there's, it's nice and sealed tight. So who still uses the bunny boot? Well, plenty of people still do in Alaska. People who are removing snow with snow removers and people who work on oil rigs, all kinds of people in Alaska still use them, as well as anywhere where it's just darn cold. And yes, even the military still uses the bunny boot to this day. The Arctic Airborne, they still use this boot exclusively. So as they're jumping out of airplanes and landing in the Arctic, they can still stay nice and toasty warm. So I wanted to talk to you about my experiences with this boot. Besides the past 10 years of being able to hike in the Colorado backcountry with this boot, there is one time that was kind of the most important or also the beginning of this boots adventure. 
and that was a long, long time ago. Well, not quite that long ago. Back in 1993, so it got to travel to a little island called the Magdalen Islands, which is just north of Nova Scotia. And I got to see the harp seals. That's me in the video. It was an uh, ambient temperature of minus one Fahrenheit. And with the wind chill, it was roughly about minus 25 degrees. So it was not pleasant out there. And yet my toes were nice and toasty warm. I never really had an issue walking around out there the all three days that we were got to go out on the ice and look at the harp seals. And that's the, when I first bought this boot, that's what I bought it for, was for this trip. So if you are wondering why the video was flickering like that, it's because the battery on the camcorder was getting so cold that the battery was dying. Something that the guides warned us about, or we got to find out, when they talked about when they had their Sorrels or whatever they used, they always would pack like all these, you know, the little heat packs. They packed them in the front of their toes and in their heels and stuff. Obviously they must have had really big extra size boots because I don't know how they did that. But just to stay warm, they put, you know, extra little heat packs in their boots. And so that proves even right there that they were just using the old boring Sorrel boots. And I never had to do that. I never had to put any heat packs or anything like that in my boot. I was completely comfortable the entire time. Uh, the only time that I got a little cool is when our helicopter crashed, but that's another story. But anyway, uh, put in the comments below if you'd like to hear my entire story about a helicopter crash. Maybe I'll uh, a little updated video on that, or maybe my whole experience of when I got to go see the harp seals. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to uh, see a video on that. But regardless, my feet have always been really warm um, with these boots. I cannot complain about these boots. They're just an amazing pair of boots that always keep your feet warm. And don't be afraid by when people tell you that they don't breathe and they keep all of the moisture in. I've never had a problem with that. Obviously you have to change your socks, but you would have to change your socks anyway with any boot. So there's not really any difference. The only difference is you actually get to have warm feet instead of cold feet. Don't be afraid of the of people saying, oh, it keeps all of the sweat in and you'll be swimming around in tons of sweat. That's not true. Yes, it does keep in all the sweat, but you're not swimming around in tons of sweat. It's not that bad. And obviously, for most of all of my camping trips, you know, I'm dealing with, you know, maybe minus one or two degrees to, you know, 10, 20 degrees. And that's normally the area that I get to use this boot in, which I don't have a problem with. And I don't have, I'm not like pouring out sweat out of my boots. That's just not the way that works. So don't be afraid of that is all I wanted to let you know. All right, I wanted to go over a couple of the different boots that I have in front of me and kind of how I have used them over the past and what I think they're good for. So this one here is a Garmont boot. It's um, discontinued, but it's a 200 gram thin slate boot. And I pretty much use this one only during the summer or like cool mornings, that kind of thing. It was designed to be a winter boot, but I never used it as that. It was just my main summer hiking boot. So now this one, this one is the Irish setter boot. And this one is still, you can still buy this one, although it looks a little different um, these days, but it's an 800 gram tinselate boot. And this one I used to use when I was used to go hunting for fall. I've gotten to hike in it once actually in the winter more or less but for the most part 
I never really used this one for winter, um, for for anything in the really in the snow, but that's a decently warm boot. But anyway, this boot can still be bought today. It looks like I said, it looks a little different, but it's uh, not a bad boot. Um, I'll throw that up there to show you what that looks like now these days. Then I have this boot. This is not my boot. This was my son's boot a few years ago. It's a or totes, totes boot. It's a really inexpensive boot. It's only 45 bucks at Kohl's. It's obviously, you know, or kind of a cheap boot. The old standard. So you have uh, the Sorel Caribou boot. And we all know, we all know this boot has, you know, good, decent features for relatively cold weather. Not extremely cold weather. I wouldn't use this boot for, you know, actually what it says down to minus 40 degrees. It's a, a decent boot, at least, you know, at least down to, you know, probably maybe minus 10, somewhere around there would probably be a good boot. And then of course you have the piso resistance. That is the bunny boot. And we know that this boot is easily able to go down to minus 60 degrees um, Fahrenheit. And so this is an amazing boot. We all know that. So that's kind of the different selection of boots that I have. And we're going to be running a few tests on these boots to kind of compare them to the bunny boot, just to see how these ones compare to the bunny boot. So welcome to my science lab. So what I have figured out is that I did the bean test first. You're probably wondering, what is a bean test? So what I did is I got to heat up some beans, put them in socks, and then put all the socks in all the boots. And then I put them outside at night for about a half an hour, and then brought them in and tested all of them to see what the temperature was of, of each sock which work pretty much what I expected, but I did have some issues with timing and I had some problems with the totes boot that it was way out of whack. It was did much better than it should have ever done. So we're going to try something totally different and something much more sciencey and something much better for you guys, because you know what? You guys deserve something much, much cooler. So here's what we're going to do. Instead of doing a boring bean bag test, we're actually going to get something much more sciencey. We're going to get an actual heat gun that actually sees in sees heat, and we're actually going to do something very interesting here. So here's the plan. What I'm going to do, if you see way over here on this end, there is a jungle boot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that jungle boot on. I'm going to run up and down the stairs first, make for like 15, 15 minutes or so, make sure everything is warm inside the boot, make sure the boot and my feet are good and warm. And then I'm going to stick my foot in the snow and I'm gonna keep it in the snow as long as I possibly can until my feet hurt, until my feet are cold. Then I'm gonna take that special camera that sees heat and we're gonna take a picture of my feet and see what that looks like. Then I'm going to do that for all the other boots, but here's the trick. I'm going to only do keep my foot in the snow as long as I had my foot in with the first boot. So it should show that if you keep my feet in the boot, that same length of time, it should be different. That is the plan. So let's find out see which one of these boots is going to do the best with conduction testing and we'll see whether the bunny boot can handle this very difficult test. So what I really wanted to do was see the difference between just a piece of leather and some thinsulate and then some wool and then obviously a lot of wool. So I wanted to just kind of see how that all plays out and this will be kind of fun to see what actually happens. And now we actually have something very sciencey. Let's do some science. All right, ready <clears throat> for science.
Okay, there we go. So what we're gonna do here, is I'm going to wait here until my feet are pretty much close to being in pain. And then we're going to check the thermal of what my toes look like once we uh, wait this out for probably about a half an hour would be my guess. So I won't uh, leave the camera on for that long probably, but I will keep you informed of how my toes feel. And of course, the nice thing about this test is that you know that snow is always gonna be cold, so it doesn't matter pretty much what the temperature is. Even though it's a nice 38 degrees outside, you always know that the snow is always gonna be, you know, snow, cold. So that's the nice thing about this test. And I'm making sure that the, I don't make a little cave for the feet and it's actually touching my, it's actually touching my toes and I'm not like creating a little cave, a little space between me and the snow. So I make sure that I keep, I keep that snow actually on the boots. And like I said before, I just put on very thin socks because I'm not trying to see what the R rating of is with socks and boots, but just see what the R rating of, of just the boots is. Oh, the things that we'll do for science, huh? They definitely feel cold though. They're not feeling comfortable. Remember, I'm doing this for you, YouTube. So here is the results from the thermal camera. Here is a good overview of all the pictures. So I wanted to show you a couple things before we kind of go into each picture. So first, this was, I wanted to show you what it looks like with just a warm foot. And that's what a, just a warm foot looks like. That's what it should look like when it's nice and toasty warm. So the other thing I want you to take a look at as we're going through the photos is I want you to look at the high temperature and the low temperature. Mostly I want you to look at this high temperature. The low temperature, yes, it'll change, but it's pretty much just the concrete that my foot was on. But the high temperature is what's very important because it will tell you what is the high of my foot. So as we're going through, you can see it kind of rise. So I'll back out a little bit. All right, so the first one is the jungle boot. Now I want to show you something special with this. So I tried to take a reading of my toes and they were, at least the knuckle there, was only 78 degrees. That seems pretty cold. And I can tell you my feet definitely and my toes were definitely very cold. But I don't want to use this photo to compare to the other pictures because it's closer up and it changes the way the ratios work with the colors. So we can't use the picture in that respect, but we can use this little dot for, uh, for temperature anyway. All right, so here we go. So yes, this is the jungle boot and you can see my toes were very cold and the rest of the upper part of my feet were very cold and even the warm part that's white was only 90 degrees. So now if you move up to the the Garmont boot which is a 200 gram boot you can see that it was one degree warmer up in here and it gets the warmth you can see tr travel down a little bit further. And then with the 800 gram Iris Setter boot, once again, you can also see that the warmth traveled down a little more and also the top temperature was a little higher. With the Totes boot, I have to be honest, this boot was is very large for my foot. It's not my boot. So I kind of crammed my foot into the front of the boot 
you know, so it's kind of was touching the boot. So the numbers are probably going to be a little off, but nonetheless, we tested it and it did, you know, decently okay. And then I had done actually a, another test before this, but it was, my foot was further back. And obviously then there was a lot of room up front. And so that they obviously did, they would do really well because you have got more air insulation in the front. So this one's probably the least accurate of all the uh, ones that we tested, just because this boot is just, it's hard to get a good reading because either my foot was too far forward or too far back. So then you have the Sorel boot. And you can see then when we made some really big gains with the warmth coming down as well as we also had some higher numbers at the top and they definitely felt quite a bit warmer. And then we have the bunny boot, which you can see also had a really even higher numbers for the top of the foot and the toes were also pretty warm as well. They weren't too bad. Definitely much warmer than just a leather boot or even these boots, the 200 gram or the 800 gram. So you can see that's the results of the thermal camera. It's kind of fun and interesting to see what, what the heat and where the, what happens. So there you go. Take that information as, as you wish. All right, let's wrap this up, shall we? So I can release you back into the wild of YouTube. So about these boots, everybody always asks, how do they fit? And just to let you know, they fit um, to their size, just like whatever size your feet are, that's the size you need to get. But there is a small catch. You do have to remember to buy thick wool socks. That is how they're designed, is to be worn with really thick wool socks. These are the socks that I like to buy, I like to wear right now. These are like my favorite socks of all the socks that I have. They're of course 100% wool. And I call these the my lumberjack socks just because they're a little taller. But I love these, they are really nice. I'll see if I can put a, a link in the description below. I also have um, a bunch of pairs of these kind of socks, which these are of course also 100% wool. And so these are, these are great too. They're nice. Um, I just really like the nice tall long ones. They're nice and warm and these just fit and they have a, just a better feel. Sometimes they're not quite as, I don't know, they just have a really nice feel. But anyway, that is the first part I wanted to, I wanted to talk about. The last part is back in 1992, the company Bata, who makes these boots, they stopped making them. And they're like, oh no, did the, are they not going to make them anymore? Can you still find them? Yes, the, there's somebody else who is still making these boots. And that is, I'll show you, this company here. And they are ADG, or also known as Airboss Defense Group. So these guys are making this boot as well as they're also making a mucklock boot that goes down to minus 67 degrees, which is also really good. As long as you don't need ankle support, I'm sure they're also a really good boot. Um, they apparently are supposed to dry relatively fast. So that could also be an option. I'm sure they're really expensive um, buying direct from them, but hey, um, if you, you know, want to buy brand new, they're probably decent. Otherwise I would, you know, go to your local surplus store and look for a set of these and you know, should pay for, you know, probably about a hundred bucks somewhere, somewhere around there. And you'll have pretty much the best boot in the entire planet. So there you go. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my next video and we'll, See you next time out there.